Alrighty y'all, uh, this is Connor Wardle, uh, back here with another Reptile Care video. I uh, apologize uh, for the uh, kind of hi hiatus, uh, momentary hiatus there. Uh, kind of life got a little bit busy, uh, but I'm back in a more uh, routine schedule now uh, following the holidays. Uh, so I'm doing a lot better and I'm able to put out some more quality uh, care videos uh, for y'all uh, today. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and get into it. Today we're talking about the... Sonoran whip snake, uh, Mascophis uh, bilinatus. Uh, this is one of my dream species uh, that I am quite lucky to have, uh, thanks to a, a, a good uh, herper friend who noticed, noticed my passion, uh, particularly with Mascophis, and uh, was willing to uh, help me out and um, just get to work with these guys in captivity. Um, so, yeah, excellent. Um, so, a little bit about uh, Mascophis bilinatus, uh, the Sonoran uh, whip snake. Uh, these guys are native to uh, extreme southwestern New Mexico, and uh, they do range into Arizona as well, uh, southeastern uh, New Mexico there. And they've got a pretty wide range uh, down in Mexico. They're typically more of a uh, Mexican subspecies there. Uh, as far as their habitat goes, uh, they're native to, uh, or their habitat kind of looks like uh, kind of oaky scrublands, uh, kind of like brushy areas uh, that are kind of drier. Uh, however, um, with these guys' habitat, uh, they do tend to have some type of um, seasonal creek or stream or something like that uh, that rolls through the area there where they're able to snag uh, small little frogs, lizards, uh, and then, of course, uh, sustain that, that life for the, those bushes and shrubs. Um, these guys are primarily, uh, or I guess their, their first um, kind of uh, defense mechanism uh, is going to be just fleeing, you know. Uh, they're going to go race up a tree or race up a shrub. Uh, they will also follow their prey up into those trees and shrubs. Uh, they are known to eat uh, birds and n nesting birds, things like that, uh, as well. Um, so if, if you notice, they're a little bit more slender body compared to the coach of some other videos. Um, that's just to help with their, their agility through the trees and with them eating kind of uh, smaller prey items, primarily lizards and birds there. Uh, they're not going to develop as much uh, mass typically uh, compared to uh, your like western coach whip that's going to have uh, <clears throat> other snakes and uh, larger rodents, things like that. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, so they've got that nice little scrubland habitat. Uh, they develop this nice blue uh, coloration as they age. Uh, you probably can't see it that well here uh, in uh, inside, uh, but that head there is a nice kind of kind of bluish there. And uh, this guy kind of likes to play dead a little bit. Uh, that's one of their another one of their defense mechanisms there. Uh, kind of interesting with Mescophis. They'll do that similar to the Heterodon there. Um, but yeah, so they start off with that kind of blue head there. It kind of transitions down down the body there to this nice kind of olive gray uh, back here towards the end. Got a really nice yellow belly here, uh, especially kind of up uh, the uh, upper third of their body there. It's kind of nice. Um, I guess it's kind of coming through as kind of more of a cream, but it's more of a, a, a yellowish here. And they've got this really awesome uh, striping here that the two uh, white uh, stripes will follow, follow with that black line that runs the length of the body there. It's really beautiful, a very pleasing animal to look at. Uh, excellent, uh, excellent display animal uh, for me, yeah, in my opinion. So anyway, yeah, so that's that's their habitat. That's kind of their, their wild diet. Um, and then just a little bit about them. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and transition to um, some captive husbandry. So as far as captive husbandry goes, um, these guys, I mean, they, they are mascophis. You know, they, they travel quite a bit, uh, a, a kind of a large distance. They are um, very active snakes. Uh, so providing a large enclosure is key. Uh, this guy's kind of on the uh, the smaller side. Uh, this one is flipped as a, uh, I'd say a little bit older than a, a yearling. I'm not quite sure uh, with it being wild caught. I'm not exactly sure uh, how old it is. Uh, however, for this particular animal here, uh, I'm currently using a 40 gallon enclosure. Um, as uh, space allows, uh, I'll be uh, upgrading this guy to a more, uh, to a, a larger setup uh, that kind of focuses more on the um, the height of the enclosure. I really enjoy those Exoterra 36 by 36 by 18s, and uh, I can see this guy uh, fitting very comfortably uh, in one of those uh, with some nice branches and things like that. Um, I do provide um, 
branches in all of my mascovis enclosures because they, they do like to climb and they are quite active. It provides a little bit of a mental stimulus uh, for them in the cage that, that I could try and provide there. Uh, as well as basking, uh, basking UVB and um, heat bulbs, things like that. As far as a target basking temperature uh, for, for these guys, I try and target a uh, hot spot of about 100 degrees, uh, which will, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, translate to about um, like low 80s, like 82 or so uh, for the ambient temperature uh, within the tank there. Uh, and then on the, the, the coolest part of the enclosure, it dips down to like 78. Uh, so with, with all of your uh, mascophis, you know, they are um, kind of, the majority of them, they, they experience uh, very, very warm temperatures uh, throughout their range, but it's important to know uh, to have a gradient, both a temperature and humidity gradient uh, for your, your animal because they aren't just desert animals, you know. Um, so that kind of leads me to my next point as far as humidity goes. Uh, rather than uh, achieve, trying to achieve a specific humidity uh, throughout the entire tank, uh, something I do with all of my animals is provide a, um, a, a humid hide box. Um, just the shed box is what I call it. Uh, basically take a um, plastic container, uh, you can kind of melt a little hole in the top there, uh, fill it with sphagnum moss, uh, keep that damp, not wet, uh, just nice and moist in there. Um, there should be a little bit of condensation there in the cage, which you'll have to kind of, uh, in the, the shed box itself, uh, which I would recommend kind of wiping out, you know, cleaning through, that way you don't get mildew and things like that. Um, but yeah, it just help, helps the snake, um, you know, your, your temperatures help your animal, uh, your temperature gradient helps your animal thermoregulate. I'm not quite sure what the, the term would be, um, but you, you want to be able to have a nice uh, humidity gradient where your animal can kind of uh, do what it needs uh, for its shed cycles and things like that. I think that's really important and it helps with hydration as well. Um, as far as feeding in captivity, uh, this this uh, guy here, he eats both uh, quail chicks and uh, frozen thawed rodents. Um, as the, the weather allows, it's kind of picking up here with the, with the temperatures uh, more regularly. Uh, I do plan to collect uh, some more of those Texas body lizards, the Scolopris uh, species, uh, just uh, to provide a little bit more enrichment into uh, their diet here. Uh, with them being uh, typically kind of a leaner, leaner species, I would like to provide um, a little bit more of a uh, leaner diet, you know, uh, with those with those frozen thawed lizards and um, just uh, bird prey rather than a rodent heavy diet for these guys, uh, just because I don't want them getting too fat, you know, too lethargic, things like that. It's not not great for them. Um, as far as uh, caging goes, like I said, I already kind of touched on that. Uh, you want to be able to provide, uh, it kind of helps with the, the temperature gradient there, uh, provide multiple uh, branches and things like that in the cage. That way it creates multiple different um, basking platforms uh, throughout the enclosure there um, and just kind of um, helps them kind of flee, I guess. I mean, they're, they're not going to be hidden, hidden in those branches there, uh, but their, their first kind of thing in the wild uh, is going to be to uh, bolt, jump up a tree, or jump into a brush or um, a bush or something like that. Uh, so it's going to be pretty helpful for them to kind of uh, acclimate a little bit better to captivity there, uh, with them uh, just feeling a little bit more comfortable by jumping up in those branches. As far as uh, the availability of these guys in captivity, uh, it is pretty limited there. Occasionally, you'll see them pop up on fauna. Uh, there is one. Uh, adult female that I saw on fauna several years ago back in I believe I don't know I was just thrown through through the uh, fauna classifieds in about 2015 or 7 I saw one saw an ad for uh, an adult female in 2012 that had been posted I'm not sure where that animal ended up a uh, very beautiful animal if you have an opportunity to check that out it's a really really pretty uh, beautiful animal there that's a, a pleasure to see um, but uh, pretty much these aren't these aren't really um, actively kept by enough people uh, to um, provide captive bred animals uh, in captivity. Uh, there is one guy, uh, Da Wei Han. I'm probably uh, mispronouncing that name. I, I can put his uh, his name in the um, I guess the little Facebook or not Facebook, excuse me, but the uh, the YouTube uh, comment section. Uh, you guys can look him up on Facebook. Um, he's the only guy I know right now actively trying to produce um, these this beautiful species, uh, Sonora bilinatus here, uh, or your Sonora mip snakes. Um, it's really, really um, excellent um, success. Well, I guess um, 
he, he's just another one of those dedicated uh, Matt Scofus keepers there. Um, I, he did have uh, a clutch, a fertile clutch, um, last season. Uh, however, those animals died in egg, unfortunately. Uh, not quite sure what happened there, uh, but we're hoping for a positive season uh, this this upcoming uh, season. That way, maybe I can get my hands on a captive bred female. That would be ideal. Um, but outside of captive breeding, uh, you do you, your only option pretty much would be maybe you see a wild caught animal at a um, expo, or you go and collect one yourself. Uh, that being said, uh, with these guys being native to Arizona, uh, you need to make sure that the animals you are getting is are legal. Uh, in the state of Arizona, you cannot legally sell um, wild caught animals from the state of Arizona, so it's important. Um, you know the history of your animals, that way you're making smart choices and um, getting legal animals. Um, it is, you are able to gift um, native uh, Arizona wildlife, or reptiles particularly. Um, so if, if you have a good friend that lives in the area, you might ask him to gift you something. Uh, but just make sure um, that you're prepared for a wild caught animal. Um, it's it's not, not for everybody, uh, and I would not recommend a wild caught animal for a pet. These are more for people with the intention of breeding. Uh, I'm not trying to gatekeep or anything like that, um, but it, it's, it's important that um, wild caught animals are used to get new genes into the hobby or to establish a species that is not established uh, into the captive hobby. <clears throat> Anyway, yeah, so this is the Sonoran Whip Snake there. Uh, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, feel free to shoot me a message. You can drop a comment on YouTube or reach out to me via uh, Instagram at uh, Naturalist Herps or Facebook. Uh, just search up Connor Wardle exactly the way it's um, presented here on my YouTube. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video, and uh, yeah, actually, you'll have a good rest of your day. Ready? See you guys.